Okay, hello everyone. It's so nice to welcome everyone tonight and I'm really excited to get started with our expert-led session on uveitis. My name is Jennifer Wilson and I'm the Executive Director of Cassie and Friends Society. And this session is part of our virtual education series, which is um, something that we're so proud to present to keep patients, families, and their healthcare teams in the juvenile arthritis community connected online, uh, especially now during the COVID-19 pandemic. Looking at the registration list for our event tonight, I'm so excited to let you know that there are um, people and patients and healthcare workers representing every province and major pediatric rheumatology center across Canada uh, tonight joining this session. So just really excited to have our community together. Um, we're gonna go to the next slide. Before we get started, I just wanted to take a second to introduce Cassie and Friends and let you know a little bit about our organization in case you haven't heard of us before. Um, Cassie and Friends was founded in 2007 to transform the lives of kids and families living with juvenile arthritis and other rheumatic diseases through research, connection, education, and support. If you've ever encountered Cassie and Friends online or maybe you've run into Cassie and Friends um, at one of our parent leaders at clinic, then you'll know the heart of our organization is bringing all the voices and stories of our community together from kids to researchers to achieve one very important mission. And if we go to the next slide, we'll see what that is. It is the pain-free future that we believe all kids affected by rheumatic conditions deserve. So before we go into our main session and introduce the speakers, I just wanted to give a few important housekeeping notes. If we go to the next slide, um, first and foremost, I would really like to thank our sponsors. Um, when COVID-19 came onto the scene, we unfortunately had to cancel three major family day education events across Canada. Those events were scheduled to uh, serve and uh, welcome over 1,100 people across Canada. And these sponsors here, Nicola Welp, Avi, Amjan, Roche, and Sobe, stepped up so that we continue to be together, even online. Next slide, please. If you have any insights tonight or you wanna help us on, on one of our main goals of our organization, which is to raise more awareness about rheumatic diseases in children, we really encourage you to participate in the session by sharing your insights and thoughts online. You can see our social channels uh, on the screen and I really encourage you to sign up so you can even stay up to date about future events. Most importantly, uh, a huge, part of our session tonight is the opportunity to directly interact and ask questions of both of our speakers tonight, which is a patient speaker and a medical expert. So down on the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see two buttons. You'll see a chat function and a Q&A. And so really important, if you have a question tonight, just pop your question into that Q&A box um, and we'll do our best to get through all the questions in our time. Um, if we don't, we have uh, been really trying our best to follow up with uh, everyone who's asked a question. Um, we have an amazing medical advisory committee who's uh, been helping us to answer those. And so we'll follow up by email and post them on our website um, after the session. Lastly, um, the conversation here and the learning and the opportunity to connect with others doesn't have to end after this session closes. Cassie and Friends this year launched an online support network where parents can connect with other parents across Canada, um, share their stories. Um, we have a medication tracker as well as a pain and an activity tracker. So lots of really great tools, but most importantly, places to find people who truly understand the journey that you're on. So um, you can access that online support network either through our website, cassieandfriends.ca slash support network, or by using the QR code on the screen. If we go to the next slide, I'm very excited to get started. So when we announced our UVID session, what we heard from parents and youth was that um, people are fearful of, or at least frustrated by UVITIS. And so we were so excited to offer this particular session. One parent even wrote on our Facebook that UVITIS is their biggest fear in JIA. And others wrote about the feeling of being lost in a sea of eye drops um, or stuck in endless waiting rooms. And I think that part of the reason for this fear 
um, and the worries and the frustration is that there are so many questions surrounding this particular complication of juvenile idiopathic arthritis. So we hope to answer some of those tonight through the real life experience of a uveitis patient, as well as a leading pediatric rheumatologist and uveitis researcher. With that, I want to introduce our two speakers today who will be working together as a team to deliver this educational session and who have been working together as a team much longer than that as a patient and a doctor. So joining us in this webinar will be um, later on in the webinar to provide uh, the medical expert overview is Dr. Alan Rosenberg. Alan is a pediatric rheumatologist caring for Saskatchewan children and youth with various forms of arthritis and related rheumatic diseases. Dr. Rosenberg also directs the activities of the Pediatric Rheumatic Disease Research and Innovation Laboratory at the University of Saskatchewan. And he is also a valued member of our Cassie and Friends Research Advisory Committee. But to start us off, I'm very pleased to introduce Becky Zarr, a past patient of Dr. Rosenberg. Becky lives in, Saskatch in Saskatchewan in Regina and grew up with juvenile arthritis and uveitis at a young age. And now as an adult, Becky works in healthcare as a nurse and has just launched an original podcast, podcast called The Blind Reality, chronicling her journey parenting, working in healthcare, and living with vision impairment as a result of uveitis. And with that, I'm very pleased to hand the mic over to Becky. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'd first like to start off by thanking both Cassie and friends and Dr. Rosenberg for inviting me here today to speak to you. My story starts off when I was around three years of age. I was a typical kid. My older brother and I constantly drove my parents crazy. One night, we were playing a game of tag in the house and we were running around the kitchen table and I tripped and fell. Everything seemed normal because I popped back up and the game continued. It wasn't until the next morning that we noticed that something had actually taken place. My right knee was significantly swollen and it was to the point that I was having troubles walking. My parents then spent the next several days trying to figure out exactly what was going on. They had taken me to various doctors for their assessment and opinion. It was by luck, I believe, that we ended up in Saskatoon at the Royal University Hospital in the Pediatric Rheumatology Department. We were introduced to a delightful doctor named Dr. Ellen Rosenberg. And it was at that point that I believe my life took a positive change. He diagnosed me on the spot with what was called at that time, posiarticular juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, which essentially is a form of juvenile idiopathic arthritis. During the same conversation, my parents had mentioned to him that I seemed to have some sort of vision deficit as well. They told him that they had taken me to several different eye doctors and that none of them had been able to diagnose me with anything. Dr. Rosenberg then decided to walk us down the hall and introduce us to one of his colleagues. He introduced us to Dr. Ken Romanchuk in the pediatric ophthalmology department. It was a pretty big day that day. Dr. Romanchuk examined my eyes and diagnosed me with arthritis in the eyes as well. So I was diagnosed with uveitis coupled with glaucoma. He continued to tell my parents some unfortunate news that the disease had taken the site entirely in my right eye and had started to significantly progress into my left eye as well. Being a parent myself now, I can't imagine how overwhelming that entire day was for my parents. But the story always goes that my parents were very appreciative of their newfound knowledge and care team. They were very happy that they finally were able to understand my diagnosis. And they had a team that was gonna help them navigate this entire complex medical situation of mine. When I was first diagnosed, I was a pretty quiet, wide-eyed, timid, three-year-old little girl. As I grew up, I realized that I was different from the other kids because of my diagnosis. However, I didn't realize how vast of an impact it would have on my entire life. Most young children's heroes 
are superheroes, rock stars, or in my son's case, NHL hockey players. But growing up, my heroes and the people that I most wanted to be like were the doctors and nurses who were providing care to me. I'll let you on on a little secret now. When I was a kid, I was in complete awe of Dr. Rosenberg. The knowledge that he had, coupled with the kindness that he displayed to me, was simply amazing. And I wanted to be just like him when I grew up. Growing up, my parents were always super supportive of me. And they always ensured that I was part of the conversations. To me, these open conversations were very beneficial. It allowed me to have a clear understanding as to what my challenges were, and it gave me the confidence that I needed to be able to communicate these issues clearly to my peers. I would be very dishonest if I said that I never had any challenges with peers teasing me about my condition. However, like other kids, I was able to quickly identify who my true friends were. To my friends, regardless of where my arthritis existed, it really wasn't a big issue to them. Because my parents were able to normalize it to me, I was quite effective in normalizing it to my peers, my friends as well. Over the years, I missed a lot of school. My absence was usually related to attending a doctor's appointment, having a therapy or a treatment performed, or going for surgery. In addition to this though, I also missed quite a few days simply because my knees were stiff and sore. Grade four, I remember being particularly challenging for me. There was a lot going on with my eyes at the time, and I had two surgeries within that one school year. I had a teacher's aide that sat with me at school. She took notes from me and she helped me complete assignments. I also recall my mom coming to school at recess to give me eye drops, which really wasn't the coolest, but it all worked out. My eye rebounded and, and correct it with glasses, I could see 2035. I believe that my arthritis has impacted my life in many ways. But with that being said, it has not always been negative. It has taught me to stand up and advocate for what I believe in. It's taught me to push and explore options that others believe are not possible for me. I've learned over the years that some of my least favorite statements and words to hear are, no, sorry, Becky, I don't believe that's the best idea for you. Oh, perhaps you should try something a little easier. And my personal favorite is, no, I'm sorry, that's not possible for you. When I hear words and statements like these, I wanna prove that person wrong more than anything else. Because of this, some people describe me as a stubborn individual. I, however, prefer to use the word persistent. I believe the same persistence has got me through many challenges within my life. I remember coming home in grade six and telling my parents, great news, I am on the cheerleading team. And the really excellent thing is, I'm the smallest one, so I get to get tossed in the air and on the top of all the pyramids. I also remember telling my parents after grade 12 that I was going to cycle around Europe for 10 days with my friends. No need to worry, though, because there's going to be parent and teacher chaperones there. My parents were clearly worried that my joints would not be able to withstand this 10-day trip, knowing very well that I am not an athletic person in the least. I told them not to worry about that, that I had a plan in place. I was going to borrow a stationary bike from a friend and train. And I totally did for about 30 minutes one day. Then I said I was ready to go. By the way, I totally made that trip. I believe that my persistent attitude proved to be most beneficial when I decided to become a registered nurse. I graduated from the nursing program in 2004, six months ahead of schedule with no accommodations. Over the years, I've often been asked why I became a registered nurse. To me, the answer is very simple. I wanted to give back for all of the amazing care that I received over the years. I wanted to be able to have a positive impact on even one person like I was impacted. And truthfully, 
I wanted an opportunity to stand on the other side of the table. That all being said, it's probably a really good thing that the frontal lobe of a human brain is not fully developed until the age of 25. As a kid, if I would have had the actual insight and full knowledge into some of the risks I was taking, I probably wouldn't have led quite as colorful of a life. Looking back though, I have no regrets. I had tons of fun growing up. When I was 24, I married the man of my dreams. When we were 30, we welcomed our beautiful boy Bennett into this crazy world. And when I was 33, I very suddenly lost the remainder of my eyesight. I had experienced what's called a global rupture and instantly I went totally blind. My entire world was flipped upside down and everything I thought I knew about life was completely gone. When this first all happened, I remember asking the eye doctor, am I going to be totally blind and stuck in the dark forever? Am I never going to be able to see anything ever again? I was told, yes, I would never see anything for the rest of my entire life. After a lot of time and reflection, my determination and persistence started to kick in. And I decided, despite hitting my rock bottom, giving up for me was not an option. So I did everything I possibly could and I defied the odds. After having multiple surgeries, trying out different treatments and being on a several medications, I was able to regain a small amount of eyesight. It's been seven years now since I lost the majority of my eyesight. I've honestly clawed and fought my way to get back to the point I'm at today. And I'm very happy. I look at myself as a slightly modified version of the person that I was before. Not in a negative way though, I believe though now that I'm more insightful, compassionate, and aware than I ever was before. And despite this presentation being virtual today, that tiny, little, timid, three-year-old little girl is now jumping for joy because I'm now standing on the other side of the table, right beside that hero that I've always admired. I would like to conclude by offering some advice and insights that I've learned over the past 40 years. First, to the parents. If you are told no or given some advice that just doesn't sit right with you, reach out and explore your options. Your child is your child and you need to advocate the very best you can on their behalf. When possible, treat them like a typical child. Let them explore and play. Let them get dirty. Let them wrestle with their siblings. Chances are they are craving this more than you could ever imagine. Create open lines of communication. Let them ask you questions. It's all right if you don't know all the answers and if you can't tell them how things will all turn out for them. But when you can assure them is, is, it, is that you will always be by their side no matter what. To the patients, get it. This isn't the easiest journey. And some days are more challenging than others. Do not let this disease or your challenges define you, but instead acknowledge it as a part of your life. Get out there and push your limits. Find your dreams and strive after them. If you really want something, don't accept no as an answer. Go out there and fight for it. Challenge yourself. And you might not be able to do something the typical way, but you will find your way of doing it. And chances are you might even do it better than everybody else. Regardless, if you're having a good day or bad, make sure you laugh and have fun every single day. This is your life and it is your time to shine. To the doctors, researchers and healthcare providers, thank you. Thank you for taking time away from your family to help ours. Your work is truly appreciative and impactful beyond what you could even imagine. I would like to say thank you to everyone for your invitation today to speak to you for your time and attention. I now have the honor of passing this presentation back to the amazing Dr. Ellen Rosenberg.
Thank you, Becky. Uh, once upon a time, I, I need a bit of a moment here. Once, once upon a time, I, I met another girl. Her name was Jessica. Uh, she was 18 months old, and that was more than 30 years ago. Jessica presented with a swollen thumb and foot, and as her mother reported, she had a lazy eye. Her right eye turned inward, and we would soon discover that her right eye was lazy because as her vision in that eye was so poor, it had nothing useful to do. Jessica was seen promptly by Dr. Ken, the pediatric eye doctor. And Dr. Ken hoped that when he passed the narrow, intense beam of light from his slit lamp equipment through the front chamber of Jessica's eye, nothing abnormal would be seen. Just as the path of a headlamp beam of a car passing through the clear night air is unimpeded, so too it was hoped with the light passing through the front chamber in Jessica's eye. Next slide, please. But when Dr. Ken, Dr. Ken did see was a foggy night as a result of abnormal protein in the eye. And there were white flecks of debris as if it were snowing in that foggy night, a result of inflammatory cells. Jessica also had a positive test for antibodies that were reacting with proteins in her cells called anti-nuclear antibodies. Next. Jessica had uveitis, inflammation of the front part of her eye, and arthritis, and the diagnosis was perfectly clear. Jessica had juvenile arthritis and associated uveitis. Making the diagnosis was easy. Understanding the condition remains a daunting mystery. There was no reason to be smug and complacent about making a diagnosis for a condition for which the cause was unknown. The mechanisms unclear, the treatment less than ideal, and a condition for which was, there was no cure. During the decades since I met Jessica, and especially in very recent years, there's been astonishing progress. Still, however, we do not fully understand the mysterious connection between eye inflammation and joint inflammation. But now we are on the brink of new insights that should make cure and prevention realistically achievable as a result of collaborative research. Another child I met decades ago was named Becky Lee Taylor. I, I knew her then as a patient. And now I know Becky Czar as a mother and a wife, a healthcare provider, an inspiration and a friend. And it's a true privilege for me to share this event with her and, and to relish in the eloquent and inspirational words that she, she told us about her journey with, with arthritis and uveitis. Next, please. So I want to talk to you this evening about some very discreet research activities that are going on. There's a huge amount of research activities in Canada and worldwide, looking at new treatments and new ways to monitor patients. But what I'm going to talk to you about is a project which we in Canada are leading with, together with some international collaborators, which is exciting because this project, we believe, may provide real insight into the cause and mechanisms of uveitis, which will then lead to more informed treatments and potentially cure and prevention. Next, please. The eye is a simple yet complex organ. When we see something, the light passes through the pupil, through the lens, and to the back of the eye, sending impulses to the nerve to the brain, which allows us to see the image. Next, please. There are three main components to the eye. 
three main layers. There's the sclera, which is the white part of the eye that surrounds the eye. It's a tough tissue that keeps, keeps the eye structures in place. The inside layer is the retina. Those light signals pass to the retina and receptors in the retina then generate an impulse to the brain, which allows us to see the image. And between those two layers is what's called the choroid plexus. Next, please. As the choroid plexus, the pink area, moves to the front of the eye, it expands out into an enlarged mass called the ciliary body. The ciliary body then tapers down to form the iris. The word iris comes from the Greek word rainbow. So it's the colored part of the eye. The iris, the ciliary body, and the choroid plexus comprise what's called the uveal tract. If one peels off the sclera and looks at the choroid plexus, which is the part of the, the eye that provides the nourishment, the blood vessels to the eye, it has the appearance of a peeled purple grape. And the Greek word for grape is uva. That's where the word uve uveal tract or uveitis is derived. Next, please. The area of interest in juvenile arthritis, most of the time, but not always, is the front part of the eye, the ciliary body and the iris. That's called anterior uveitis, anterior meaning it's towards the front of the eye. The iritis refers to inflammation of the iris. Other terms are iridocyclitis, referring to the iris and the ciliary body. Now, while that anterior part is most commonly involved more than 80% of the time, other parts of the eye farther back can also be inv involved. Sometimes all the uh, sections of the eye can be involved, which is referred to as panuveitis. That's much less common in juvenile arthritis. Next, please. The risk factors associated with uveitis in juvenile arthritis is oligoarticular JIA. Oligo meaning few joints involved, fewer than five joints. Girls are more affected than boys. Children are usually young, but it can begin at any age. And they have a positive test for that anti-nuclear antibody. Each of those features is an added risk factor for uh, uveitis associated with JIA. Next, please. So the question is, why do jo does joint inflammation and eye inflammation occur together? It seems odd that just those two organs should be involved. Next, please. Well, part of the explanation we think might relate to collagen. Collagen is really what keeps us together. It's the connective tissues of our body. And collagen is everywhere in our body in every organ and tissue. There are many different types of collagen, each serving somewhat different functions. Next, please. But there are two types of collagen I'd like to mention tonight, type one collagen and type two collagen. And both these collagen types are present in both the joints and the eye. Next, please. So type one collagen in the joint is present in bone, in ligaments, in tendons, and in the synovial membrane. The synovial membrane is a sac that surrounds the joint and keeps the structures and the lubricating fluid within the joint. Next, please. And in the eye, the ciliary body and the iris contain type one collagen. Next, please. Type two collagen is present in only two areas of the body, in the cartilage of the joints, the cartilage which keeps the joint, the slippery surface of the joint, which allows it to move easily, and then the vitreous fluid. The vitreous fluid is a jelly-like fluid represented by the red ball in the picture um, that keeps the, that maintains the shape of the eye, provides the, the glow bar shape to the eye. So type two collagen is present just in the vitreous and in the cartilage of the joints. Next, please. Now, 
animals exposed to type 2 collagen develop arthritis as shown on the right. The joints become swollen and imaging studies of the bones show considerable destruction. Next, please. There is also some evidence that when animals are exposed to type 2 collagen, not only do they get arthritis, but some small number, and depending on the strain of the animal, will also develop uveitis, suggesting a, suggesting a possible connection between type 2 collagen and the involvement of those two organs. Next, please. Type 1 collagen, as we mentioned, is present in the iris and the ciliary body, those areas which are, which are most commonly involved in uveitis and JIA. Next, please. And one can derive from those, that area a protein called melanin protein. Next, please. And when animals are exposed to melanin protein, they develop uveitis, and as has been shown in a preliminary way, they also develop joint destruction. What's interesting is that melanin protein is essentially like type 1 collagen. It represents a segment of the type 1, type 1 collagen molecule. Next, please. So what we're interested in is linking all these elements of uveitis and JIA together. The arthritis, the uveitis, the positive anti-nuclear antibody test, the young onset age, and the predominance in girls. Next, please. There's likely to be some genetic susceptibility. It is not as if there is a single gene which is causing this condition, but rather genetic factors that might make a child susceptible uh, to developing uveitis associated with JA when other conditions are met. So there are genes that tend to be associated with a higher risk for uveitis. And there are also genes which tend to produce more proteins that break down collagen. And some of those enzymes occur more commonly in young girls. Next, please. So, those increased enzymes break down collagen and produce a molecule, a portion of the collagen molecule, which is the uh, identical to the MAA, the, the protein derived from the iris and the ciliary body. Next, please. And that segment can produce both uveitis and arthritis in experimental models. What's also interesting is that that molecule derived from type one collagen, next please, is essentially the same or very similar to a protein in the center of the cell that can cause a positive anti-nuclear antibody test. Next please. We also know that certain infectious agents have a bit of collagen on their surface that allows that infectious agent to bind to its target. And some of those infectious agents release a protein that degrades collagen. So here we have a hypothesis that may explain all the different elements of J the JIA uveitis picture. This is a project which is being undertaken, a nationwide project in Canada with collaborators from the Netherlands and from the United States, but is led by, by uh, the Canadian group. Next, please. Now, what we've been talking about so far is the more common, the most common type of uveitis in JIA. This is the type that begins at a young age, it's usually not associated with many symptoms, occurs more in girls with few joints involved, and it tends to be more chronic. There is another type of uveitis, 
which is more acute and symptomatic. That is the children will more commonly present with red sore eyes and the episodes of uveitis may be self-limited. That is, they may uh, disappear with short courses of therapy. What's fascinating about this type of uveitis in, in this particular type of JA, which occurs called ERA, which occurs mostly in boys at an older age of onset, is that there's some exciting emerging information suggesting that that type of uveitis may be linked to the intestinal microbiome. The intestinal microbiome is the collection of bacteria which we all have in our bowels normally. Next, please. However, if that microbiome is altered for a variety of reasons, some genetic, some environmental, the bowel may become inflamed, those bacteria may spread outside the bowel, and an immune reaction to those bacteria may cross-react with proteins in the eyes and the joints. This type of research is exciting and just emerging, so we'll certainly keep watching because it may be that interventions such as nutritional interventions may help alter the gut profile and help uh, reduce the severity of the, of the uveitis and arthritis perhaps. Next, please. Now, we are on the brink of, of one of the most um, astonishing periods, I believe, in, in the history of humankind an era when we will finally and fully begin to understand how we work. And that's true of uveitis and, and juvenile arthritis. We will uh, begin to fully understand this condition. And with that will come much more likely, uh, the cure and prevention will be much more realistically achievable. And certainly with the pace of progress uh, that's going on, it's not unrealistic to believe that in your child's um, lifetime or early adulthood even, that, that there are going to be dramatic, dramatic changes. Next, please. So what we have discussed is that the eye and the joint share a number of important biological features and that there are likely multiple factors which interact to cause uveitis and arthritis and that the continued collaboration and funding is required to propel us towards cure and prevention. And I, I should say that the, the pace of progress is, is really limited not by energy or ingenuity or technology or collaborations. Uh, it's limited by money. And that's why uh, Cassie and friends with their, uh, their fundraising efforts and their education and and um, knowledge translation and research support, the Arthritis Society, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, private donors are, have all been so important in um, allowing us to, to progress with our research in Canada. And in Canada, we have a very powerful culture of collaboration that I believe is the envy of the world. And as a consequence of that, uh, can Canadian uh, colleagues have been leading worldwide initiatives. Um, so we're very excited about what's happening now and what's going to be happening in the near future. And I know Becky and I would be happy to address your questions, but we'd also be delighted if we could hear about your ideas about how we can improve the, the understanding and care of children uh, with uveitis and associated uh, arthritis. Thank you. Thank you so much to both Alan and Becky. Um, Becky, your story really touched me because I just, I felt so connected to it in that we also believe that anything is possible for whether that be a child, a teen, a young adult, and or an adult um, affected by juvenile arthritis and all the complications that may come with that. And it's, it's what drives us as well as in, in our work every day to support this community and to hear your words of advice, um, you know, both from patients to parents to healthcare workers just really, really touched me. And then I know it inspires our team at Cassie and Friends and everyone here listening um, to do the best for kids, for the futures that they deserve. Um, Dr. Rosenberg, I just have to say you, you, you showed us what we've always seen and known in this community, um, 
and that we celebrate every day. And that's to achieve the results that we want for kids with juvenile arthritis, we need to be a team. Um, whether that be kids, parents, doctors, nurses, ophthalmologists, family doctors, grandparents, therapists, teachers, researchers. I made a list while you were talking, but the most important part about that team and what I see in this community is that we are a team that cares so deeply for one another, that's fighting for the exact same goal and who cherishes every experience and outcome as a step to the, the path that we want to see, which is a pain-free future for kids. Um, I'm really looking forward to our, our question and answer now. We have actually so many questions coming in through our live Q&A, so I'm excited to get started um, and then to loop back at the end um, to the hope for the future that um, both you, Dr. Rosenberg, as a researcher and you, um, Becky, as a patient who's willing to share your story and experience are making possible. Um, so with that, um, I think we want to get started in just one question that came through, um, which I know is a, is a big question for a lot of parents whose children aren't currently experiencing any arthritis symptoms. Um, how important is it to keep checking for uveitis when a child's arthritis has been inactive, say for years or two years? And Dr. Rosenberg, you can take this one. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, yes, it's an important question. Um, if, if the child has arthritis only and has never had uveitis, then the follow-up is less rigorous. But if the child has arthritis and the question is, uh, the child has had arthritis and uveitis uh, in the past, how frequently is the follow-up for the uveitis required. So it depends on a lot of factors, including the risk factors. So if the child is in a high-risk group, has had uveitis activity before, the severity of the uveitis, um, the treatment that's been required will all have to be taken into consideration. What is um, important to recognize is that although a child may have had arthritis and uveitis, the two uh, the two areas of the body don't flare up at the same time. There is no clear connection between a flare of arthritis and uveitis. So we can't rely on a flare up of arthritis to dictate a need for the eyes to be checked. So generally the recommendation, there is an initiative now where Canadian as well as United States groups are trying to standardize approaches for follow-up. So the general feeling is that follow-up every three months for children with uveitis is required. The high risk group should probably be followed up every three months, even if they haven't had uveitis. And then other factors take, are taken into consideration um, when making a decision about follow-up frequency. Amazing. So Alan, actually we had another question totally related to that and that was, does uveitis have flare-ups? Does it behave in a similar fashion as GIA? And what I hear you saying is the flare-ups are not related or, or not easily correlated. Yes, exactly. The, so temp, uh, in terms of the time of the flare-up, they're not related. So, but, but arthritis can flare. Um, children on medications, stable medications may flare for reasons that we don't quite understand yet. Um, and the uveitis may do the same same thing, but the flare-ups are not coincident. They don't necessarily occur at the same time. Um, and in terms of, of what might cause a flare-up, we actually had one parent asking whether seasonal allergies, and they said bad ones, um, could cause uveitis to act up. And, and I'd love for you to answer that, and then Becky also just to weigh in based on your ex experience as well and what patterns you might have seen. Yes, it's, it's a very interesting question and one which some years ago I would have dismissed, but there is some emerging um, preliminary information, uh, a group in Stanford in 2019, uh, sorry, 2013, did a chart review of their patients for seasons and, and looked at allergy medications and found that children with uveitis were more likely to have a be on allergy medications and have seasonal allergies. Having said that, there's no evidence to suggest that you are necessarily related biologically. 
This was simply an observed association, but it does prompt us to wonder whether there may be some environmental factors, not so much which cause uveitis, but which might aggravate uh, the inflammation of the eye and allow the uveitis to, to manifest more strongly. Um, one also has to recognize that, that both allergies and uveitis relate to the immune system and, and disruption of the immune system by, by one factor, seasonal allergies might somehow alter the control of the uveitis by the natural immune system. So a lot of interesting questions come from that. And I think it may be a, a, a good area of research focus in the future. Hmm. And Becky, maybe you can comment on that. Yeah, you know, um, my experience is two of my big triggers that I've noticed over the years is stress and fatigue. Um, usually if I'm having a big flare up, I can kind of pull it back to a moment that I've either been really stressed about something or my entire system has been run down. Um, in regards to the allergy component, I have to say that I agree, I wouldn't a non-believer, however, um, I'm, and I'm not saying that this is directly related to my uveitis. However, since my vision has significantly decreased, I notice even with a change of barometric pressure that I can see that my vision is sometimes fluctuating uh, around that. So I've tried to kind of map it out a little bit myself, but again, it's that's just my patient um, two cents. Thanks, Becky. And actually, Becky, I'll keep you on that sort of stream because we've, we've had a couple questions um, one directly relating to sort of COVID delaying in-person exams for many GIA patients um, past the three month standard, um, but also in general, like what are, is there anything that parents can do to monitor at home? And uh, is there any way to sort of help a child um, either? And I know, you know, obviously sometimes UVITIS can be asymptomatic, but when there are symptoms, what were some of the things that, that helped you find relief? Yeah, you know what, I think I've become better at this as the years have kind of trickled by in figuring out what my symptoms are and the little um, indicators that I'm able to pick up on. Because lots of times my uveitis isn't attributed to or related to um, any type of pain at all. Um, I, my parents are always very keen, and this is obviously way prior to COVID, um, in keeping my appointments routine. It was, to me, it was always a treat. If I got past the six month mark, like we, we always had a reason to celebrate. Um, so, you know, be cautious and don't be afraid to make that phone call. I have been seen through COVID many times for my, my follow-ups. I, you know, I go quite routinely. And if you ever have an issue, usually your, your healthcare provider is willing to hear what your current concerns are, regardless of what's going on and happy to usually see you as well. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Rosenberg, on the clinical side, like obviously, you know, some parents, especially in the beginning stage of COVID, were trying to reduce their number of interactions. So how have you been uh, advising patients on the, the clinic side about um, keeping up with the regular screening in addition to, say, their rheumatology appointments? Yes, it's an important point, and I certainly can appreciate the anxiety that that parents have. Uh, evaluation of the eyes by an eye doctor is, of course, the, the most reliable way to monitor uveitis. However, um, amid COVID, there, there can be things that, that parents can watch for at home. As Becky mentioned, usually there are no symptoms, so it's difficult. Uh, but if, if a parent notices a young child may, may seem to be having some uh, visual difficulties or an older child who maybe recognize changes in vision, then that's a, a point where they should certainly uh, seek attention. Um, Sometimes there can be a bit of irregularity around the pupil. And if parents notice that occurring, they should seek a prompt attention. And there can sometimes be a white band that forms across the, the pupil, which is also a signal of activity. But having said that, I think that every effort should be made for the child to be seen uh, by a health professional for examination of the eye. And if it's difficult uh, to get into the regular ophthalmologist, then under these circumstances, I think it's perfectly appropriate to see if they can get in to see an optometrist. And the optometrist certainly can, 
can screen for uveitis and if they have concerns, they can connect with the ophthalmologist. So I, I'm hoping that as, as in the near future, everyone will become more comfortable with, with this um, unsettled time, um, not, not totally comfortable, but at least adapt in a way that we can ensure that those children who require care are not disadvantaged because of, uh, of being amid this, this COVID situation. Um, we, ha we had kind of one unexpected question that um, might not be easy to answer, but I know a lot of parents will relate to, and that is, why are there such long wait times in the ophthalmologist's office? <laughs> well, I don't know. Um, uh, Becky, you've, you may have had, I think, knowing, knowing your ophthalmologist, I think you've had good access to, to care. Um, I think what's what's occurring now in Canada at least is that we are working more with the ophthalmology colleagues. Um, and I think with these new standards that are being developed, it's going to be easier for ophthalmologists to, to know what the standard of care is and, and comply with that. The reality is, however, that in many communities in Canada, there are no pediatric ophthalmologists and in my province of Saskatchewan, where we have a large rural and remote population, there are no local ophthalmo pediatric ophthalmologists or even ophthalmologists. So we, uh, we do certainly have to ad work with our ophthalmology colleagues, advocate on behalf of our patients. In my career, which is now an ancient one, I have never ever had difficulty in, in accessing care myself. So if at any time a parent has concerns, I, th I think they, they can call us, call our pediatric rheumatology programs, and we might be able to expedite, we should be able to expedite access um, as necessary. Nice. I'm hoping that if uh, th there may not be any of my pediatric rheumatology colleagues on the call, probably not because they know more than I do, but if any of them want to jump in with any of the answers to these questions, um, please don't hesitate to do so. I happen to know there are some of your colleagues on the Oh, oh. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you didn't tell me that before. I would have been even more. And, and they can't, well, they could weigh in, I guess, through the Q&A, but actually no. um, after the session, for sure, we um, will right. do sort of a written Q FAQ. So if anyone had anything um, they wanted to contribute, they could send that too. Great. So kind of staying in the symptom genre, which we're getting a lot of questions around. I'm actually, I'm just going to read the question out from the parent and then maybe Becky, you can just let us know if you experienced this symptom or any correlation. And then um, Dr. Rosenberg, you can sort of fill in from, from the medical side. So she, the parent wrote, our daughter cannot handle even the smallest bit of brightness. Is light sensitivity common with uveitis? Yeah, um, you know what? It, it varied throughout my childhood and adult life as to how sensitive I was with light. Looking back, I didn't even recognize it, but I, if you look in pictures of me, I always had my right eye pretty much completely closed from squinting just because of the sensitivity that went around it. But there are ways to get around it. Um, I mean, you wanna live as normal and as active of a life as you can or your daughter can. Um, we have blackout blinds in our house. And so sometimes, you know, even seasonal, when the sun's a little bit lower in the air, I find that the brightness factor really um, can, can be bothersome. Wearing a hat and get really good sunglasses. It's an investment, the sun, sunglass component is. I get that they can be somewhat expensive for the ones that have really good lenses on, but you will it will cut the glare down and really reduce that sensitive, sensitivity. So yeah, for sure, my, personal experiences, um, light sensitivity can for sure go with the uveitis, but. Alan? Yes, yes, it is a, a common a complaint um, with uveitis and, and there are probably many different reasons why it occurs, but I think one of the reasons is that the, the iris, the colored part of our eye, which is inflamed, um, when, when we're exposed to bright light, it constricts, it gets smaller to limit the amount of light going through. When we, um, in, a dark, in, a, in a dark environment, the pupil enlarges to allow more light to come through. So the pupil is constantly, the iris is constantly moving. And if it's inflamed, it can be uncomfortable. Another consideration is that um, the, 
the iris, because it's inflamed, can sometimes get bound down to the lens, which sits underneath it, and it gets stuck there with almost like scar tissue. So it can't move normally. And, and so when you're in a bright light, it can't constrict to limit the amount of light. The other consideration is that some children may be on eye drops that expand, that dilate their pupil. Uh, they, they're on those drops to ensure that the iris moves and doesn't get bound down. So all those factors are likely, likely come into play, um, but it is certainly a well-recognized um, symptom. I think it may be slightly more common even in, in children with acute uveitis. The uveitis associated with occurs in the older children, but, but it certainly occurs in, in the JIA uveitis. And we had a, just another question, kind of just about like how uveitis shows up. And the question from a parent was, is, is the vision affected differently than in, let's say, like common near or farsightedness, or does it just mainly cause general blurriness? Becky's the expert on that. <laughs> well, for me, I had a lot going on all at once. So I had um, the uveitis, glaucoma, I had cataracts and everything. So for me, it's really hard to pinpoint what the exact um, issue was going on at that particular time, causing the blurredness. For me, it was a general blurredness that, um, that was pretty much maintained. And then once I was able to get the inflammation under control, then typically my vision did kind of resolve and come back to its, its new normal. It was never 2020 in that left eye, um, but that's kind of how it worked for me. Um, I, I can only imagine that touches so many of the hearts of parents who are just wondering like, what is my child seeing, especially in the younger kids who maybe can't articulate. Yeah, and I, that was my parents' problem is that, you know, I was little and I couldn't quite articulate what exactly I could see and I was tripping over some things and, you know, they were getting dead ends essentially when they're trying to seek out this information. I am to date myself, I'm 40 years old now. So when I was getting diagnosed, this wasn't a common association where people were, you know, making those links together. So like I said, I was really lucky to stumble upon Dr. Rosenberg who was really on top of it, so. Mm -hmm. I think, um, as Becky points out, this, this condition is most common in very young children. So one to three years of age, it can begin at any age, of course. But, and so those children can't be relied on really to comment on, on their vision. And even in older children, the visual changes may be subtle. But if you recall that, uh, that second slide that I showed with the light passing through the, the eye, ordinarily it's perfectly clear but if there's protein fogginess, if there's cells, the snowflakes, you can imagine that, that that's going to impair vision somewhat. So as in that first picture I showed, sometimes the, the lazy eye story uh, occurs, or as Becky said, the children had just lost some of their normal dexterity and, and the parents recognize that there's something unusual. Mm -hmm. Okay, so going into sort of like practical advice, so one parent asked, so they've been using an optometrist regularly, quarterly for their young child. Um, they use a slit lamp, but they're asking, should they switch to an ophthalmologist? And, and are there any long-term side effects from frequent slit lamp checkups? Um, no, the, the slit lamp is a, is a safe, um, very safe. There's really no side effects from that. The question of ophthalmology and op optometry is one that's been discussed and I think it varies um, amongst communities and varies according to accessibility. Certainly in my experience, uh, the, op the optometrists do a good job in our rural and remote areas. They know who to contact for, uh, for ophthalmology input. They keep communicate with us regularly. Um, so I, I think we, we can rely on their expertise. Of course, if you have a pediatric ophthalmologist who's easily accessible, that, you know, that just uh, is, is a somewhat different level because they also will prescribe the medication. So they can monitor the eyes while also knowing what the medications are and adjust in consultation with the rheumatologist, adjust the medications. The optometrists don't, don't have that. So for screening purposes, I think the optometrists uh, will generally be able to, to pick up 
uh, recurrence of activity or worsening activity, and then connect with the ophthalmologist for, for uh, further assessment. And um, Becky, this question's for you because no matter who's doing the exam, a lot of kids have a really hard time getting those vision tests done, whether that be the bright lights or the stained drops, and that can cause a lot of stress. Um, based on your experience, do you have any help for parents wanting to help their kids in these appointments? And, and how did you handle those drops as a kid? Yeah, just normalize it. Make sure that they're aware of, you know, depending on what their maturity level is, um, and readiness, make sure they're aware of what they're there for and what to expect. Um, the last thing that they want to do is come into something that's unexpected and then having, you know, a drop or something be put into their face that they weren't anticipating. Practice at home if you can, mm -hmm. even if it's saline drops or something and get your child used to actually the feel of getting it administered and it gives you practice too. Um, I mean, bring some stuff to entertain your kiddo because sometimes like we heard, it is a little bit of a longer wait um, I've heard that lots when I've been waiting over the years for my appointment times. And I usually kind of giggle and say, don't worry, we're waiting for the best. So the best takes time. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I kind of remind people of that when it comes to the drops, um, sometimes they can give you a bit of a headache. That was my experience with, them, with the dilation drops. So what we did is sometimes I get, I just took like a Tylenol prior to, um, in anticipation of that and brought my sunglasses along because I knew I was going to be hypersensitive, sensitive to light when I left there as well. Um, and just to add in a little comment in the last question, I believe it's all about creating a team. And I believe there's a place for an ophthalmologist and an optometrist to work all together collaboratively and um, to share in the, in the work process. Um, my pediatric ophthalmologist was in Saskatoon, so two and a half hours away from where I live. I had an ophthalmologist here in Regina, and then I also had an optometrist too. So they all played really nicely together in the sandbox and were all working towards the exact same goal. Awesome, that's great. Um, Alan, there, so there's one question that's sort of just a, a pattern that a parent has noticed, and that's when their daughter is off her biologic medications, she often gets uveitis. And their question um, is that, and that she recovers when back on her biologic. So their question was just in your sort of medical perspective in the history of your career with the introduction of biologic medications, um, have you seen the number and degree of uveitis diagnosis actually going down? Um, so that's an excellent question. Um, and I, I don't have an answer to it. But so the question is, if, if a child is being treated um, for the arthritis only with a biologic, and that child without the biologic would have been destined to have uveitis, have we prevented the uveitis from occurring because of the biologic? We don't know. Uh, we just don't know that. But it is conceivable that that's true because we do know that that certain biologics that work very well for arthritis are also now a mainstay of of transforming the care for uveitis as well. And and certainly if if this child who you described uh, flares went off biologics and settles went on biologics, it it indicates that the the biologic is is um, is controlling uveitis, but it's it's a brilliant question, uh, which which is going to be challenging to to answer uh, unless until we have longer term follow up and show that the the prevalence of uveitis in those treated with biologics has dramatically decreased, and we can make an association. Once we have a better understanding of the actual biology of uveitis through the kinds of research I described then we can actually target certain proteins, certain inflammatory proteins with a select personalized choice of a biologic. And then we'll have a much more biologically based evidence for saying that yes, we can perhaps prevent uveitis from flaring and perhaps occurring in the first place. Perfect. Um, we have so many questions about nutrition and uveitis. And I feel like we have a whole nother session in the works on intestinal microbiome. So thank you so much for, for bringing that out in your presentation. And maybe, um, you know, because it's a much deeper topic, maybe just the simplest question 
um, to link the two, but have there been studies about the role of nutrition and uveitis? Um, there have been lots of reports. And if you go on the internet, of course, you're going to find nutritional cures for uveitis. But, but really, there has not been any substantive real evidence-based um, evidence that nutrition can alter the course of uveitis. Having said that, there hasn't been a lot done. Um, but the questions like the microbiome may be altered somewhat by nutrition. And that kind of science is just emerging. So while we might have dismissed nutrition as being important for uveitis or arthritis, we now know that certain nutritional constituents can alter the immune system. But, but be cautious, I, I would urge you to be cautious about, about the, the abundance of information that you can get that's not really scientifically proven. But I can assure everyone that that, that kind of question is not being dismissed, that there is increasing enthusiasm for, for looking at, at environmental factors, nutrition, all, in genetics, all those factors that, that can interact. And there just are so, I mean, so many questions. And I think that's how we even open the session to say that one of the reasons, you know, uveitis causes so much fear and stress and worry is that there are a number of, of open questions. So the work you're doing in research, of course, is so important and your colleagues to, to try and answer some of those questions. Um, one, you know, in the sort of fear related category is, um, you know, parents have a lot of stress and worry about the use of steroids in treatment. Um, and we have quite actually quite a few parents as I'm looking through the Q&A, um, trying to figure out how to sum up all their questions into one. But um, uh, I guess it, there's a lot of questions about, um, you know, if steroid drops seem to be the only thing that's keeping that uveitis at bay, and it feels like it's gone on too long. How long? Yes. Too long? Yes. Another superb question, and a question that has been addressed by this group that is developing the standardized approaches. So, for example, how long do you, are you on steroids before you add a biologic? What is known from earlier studies, and I think this is still true, is that low dose daily steroids, one to two, uh, less than three drops a day, is associated with negligible adverse effects. Not completely zero, but negligible. So it's always a balance between the risk of the medication and, and the risk of uveitis. Uveitis, of course, can cause cataracts and can cause vision loss. And high dose steroid drops can do the same. But the, the evidence suggests that, that fewer than two, uh, three drops a day, so one or two drops a day, is associated with neg negligible adverse effects. So if a child can be maintained on that low dose, plus other agents, a methotrexate or a biologic agent, then that low dose steroid may be okay. If they can get off entirely, that's great. But, but generally, the ophthalmologists seem to think that while they're not um, minimizing the risk of any steroid drop, the risk for that low dose is negligible. At higher doses, more than three drops a day, the risks grow up go up substantially. So no one would be comfortable with long-term high dose steroid use. That's when you started introducing other therapies to, as a steroid sparing agent. Mm -hmm. um, I think we are, we're getting really close to our, our 5.45 time. But um, I think, you know, what everyone wants to know, of course, is that crystal ball into the future. And, um, we, you know, one of the questions we've had asked, and we've had several around, you know, asking about remission, et cetera, but the monitoring for uveitis and, and, you know, Becky, I'm so interested in your sort of perspective as an adult, you know, living with the impacts of GI and uveitis and, and, and your continued treatment and monitoring. But is monitoring for uveitis, once they've been a child's been diagnosed with it, lifelong? Um, I know often parents hear that word quiet, but is it ever gone? And is there ever a time they can just stop worrying about it, which is what we'll maybe call remission? <laughs> Well, I, I, sound, I sound very negative when I say settle in, it's a long journey. Um, it's from my personal experience, it's a lifelong journey. 
Yep. I started when I was three. I'm 40 right now. And I still go get my checkups for my uveitis. They've tried taking me off and weaning me off and switching up the drops and stuff, but I'm still on it. And you know what, the way I look at it is it's, it's a couple of drops a day. And to give you that peace of mind that your child's vision is going to stay potentially where it's at, it's worth the risk. It's worth the time. It's worth the, the checking in and going to those appointments. It's going to make you feel a lot better as well if you're feeling that it's monitored. Um, and, and do whatever you can for your child while they're a child. Um, and then guess what? They're going to be an adult and you get to toss it to them to look after and say, look, I've looked after you for the past 18 years. Tag, it's your time. Um, and help mentor them into that new position because they'll have to take it on. Alan, did you have anything to add on that? Well, I, I, I agree with Becky, but I, I certainly am optimistic that we're going to, there are going to be uh, huge advances in our understanding and management of, of the disease. But in the meantime, um, I, one of the challenges we have, and I think we're, we're very, in the pediatric community, very conscious of this, is that we can't rely on, on our on last seeing our patients when they're 17 or 18, and then they move on and we, we don't know what happens to them. Children, people live in a continuum and we have to do a better job, I believe, in working with our adult colleagues and really understanding what the long-term outcomes of are, are of our patients because that may alter what we do when they're younger. If when they leave our clinic, they're great, but five years later, they're having problems. We should know that uh, so that we can maybe alter our management when, when they're children to prevent that from occurring. So I think we're getting much better at, at forming these alliances with our adult colleagues and ensuring that we have appropriate um, informed follow-up of our patients long-term because our role is, as pediatric rheumatologists is not just to care for the children as children. We're in it for their long-term futures. Um. Well, speaking of those long-term futures, I think, um, you know, if, if anything, if this session serves as a really important reminder to families who, you know, think or thought or weren't sure if uveitis was a concern for them, um, I think, you know, just that reminder of how critical uveitis screening is for any child with suspected or confirmed arthritis to work with your pediatric rheumatology team to understand what the risks for your specific child are is just so critical and important. Um, Alan, what is, you know, a lot of parents are asking about what, what is the chance of uveitis causing blindness if not, you know, properly screened for, caught and treated? Yes. So the, the earlier data um, suggested that about 30 to 40% of children will have long-term, essentially normal vision. 30 to 40% will have visual disability to varying degrees. Now, I think that, that that's going to change as we, as we now have new therapies, we're treating children much earlier, more aggressively earlier. So it's too soon, I think, um, to say for sure, but I do believe the outcomes are improving. And long, again, long-term, uh, 10, 20, 30 years, 40 years uh, is what we really need to know. And, and it will take a bit of time, but um, I, th I think those outcomes are improving for sure. Yeah. And maybe, you know, just um, to end our discussion and, and to thank you guys on that note, um, Becky, what is, you know, your, and your, your presentation earlier just laid it out all so well, but your, your biggest hope for the future for uveitis? Yeah, you know what, I'm highly optimistic. Some people call me an overly optimistic individual, but I'm highly optimistic that we're going to look back and say, remember when? Remember when we were concerned? Remember when we had the stress and, and you know, worry about this? And we're going to reflect and say, look we, where we were and look where we are now. People, again, they say I'm overly optimistic, but I say, I'm going to see it again within my lifetime. I just don't know the date and time yet. But when that becomes available, assure yourself I will be in line. <laughs> and we'll be here to celebrate you, Becky. <laughs> and cheer with you. Um, I want to thank both you and 
Dr. Rosenberg just so much for being a part of this session. We um, have so many more questions. So clearly this is a topic just so important to patients and families and the fact that both of you took your time to be here tonight um, at a time when so many people are at home isolated and, and have their lives changed is just so special. And um, yeah, we just, uh, this actual uh, webinar has been recorded. So we really look forward to making it available online if anyone wants to refer back. Uh, we will timestamp it and we will um, do our best to answer all questions that came through our Q&A um, and post them online. And we will email and update when those are available as well. So thank you so much to the both of you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, for and Cassie and friends for everything you do. It's wonderful. We're, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We're, we're so happy to do it. Um, and again, if you're a parent or um, a family online and you want to talk with other parents in our online community, you can do that now by going to the Cassie and friends uh, forward slash support network website or using the QR code on screen. Um, sharing stories is one thing that we have seen uh, just having a huge impact in um, just making other people feel understood and secure and just like mining the experiences of other people um, who really understand what you and your child are going through. Um, so that is a, a key place to do it. Um, so I'm just gonna quickly close uh, what's next. After this event, um, we are gonna send out a post-event survey your feedback is so important, um, both in understanding how we can do better for current events or future events, um, but also what other topics that you would like to hear from um, and have Cassie and friends uh, organize in terms of bringing expert speakers and patients together. Um, two of our next events are um, on Thursday, November 5th, we're having a session all about teen transitions. Um, not only will you hear from uh, teens and parents who've helped their teens transition into adult care, but we'll also meet a real um, clinic, JIA uh, transition clinic team from the Women's Hospital in Toronto, and also hear from a pediatric rheumatologist at SickKids about how they prepare um, teens to make that transfer into adult care. Um, and then to close the year, a really important topic to our community, um, a registered psychologist from BC Children's Hospital will be leading a session on anxiety, and depression in children with rheumatic diseases. And, and this can span everything from needle phobia um, to some of the more complex mental health um, yeah, consequences of juvenile arthritis and living with pain. So we're really excited to offer those two sessions uh, for the remainder of 2020. Next slide. Um, just one last huge thank you to our sponsors, uh, Nicola Wealth, Avi, Amgen, Roche, and Sovi. Um, have all made this series possible. So we're, we're so thankful for that. Um, of course, it is our intent to continue to offer um, even more educational uh, opportunities for uh, patients and families. So if you enjoyed this um, presentation tonight and if you are moved to do so, um, we invite you to also support our mission at Cassie and Friends and to support um, the opportunity to deliver education like this by making a donation uh, and you can do that at cassieandfriends.ca. Most importantly though, Cassie and Friends is about building a community, um, striving towards that vision of a pain-free future for kids. So if you would like to be a part of that community and or support our mission in any way, whether that's through time, volunteering, sharing your story, um, we invite you to connect with us and you can do that um, by any of the ways you see on the screen. Thank you very much. Uh, I really look forward to hearing your feedback on this session and to following up on your questions. I hope you all have an amazing Saturday night and a great weekend. Thank you. <laughs>